Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Opto Sessions. I'm excited to welcome Jeff Ross back onto the show, founder and CEO of Valeshire Capital Management. How are you doing, Jeff? I'm doing great, Ed. Thanks for having me back on your show. It's been a while. I know we were just talking about, yeah, probably about a year, uh, which is mad because a lot has happened, obviously. It's been pretty interesting in the markets, to say the least. Um, what, have you, what have you been up to? I mean, you, you said you've gone back into your other career now. Yeah, so I, I took a, about a year and a half sabbatical from doing radiology. That's what's behind me for people wondering. These are radiology monitors. So when I'm not doing Valeshire, I, I read radiology for hospitals. Uh, and so that's great. It works well. I do both of them from home. I do Valeshire from here. Where I'm sitting right now is this is my Valeshire side of the office, and that's my doctor side of the office. And having a lot of, <laughs> having a lot of fun doing both. It was a very refreshing break that I took, and so I'm, but I'm glad to be back. And so no patients come to you. They're just sent to you. The, the, yeah, okay, everything's sent to you. And yeah, you in fact, you in it. fact, my patients, the, one, the scans that I'm reading are actually uh, about, uh, I think it's about 2,000 miles away in New York from where I am here in Colorado. So yeah. I'm, just, I'm just reading the studies at any, for people who are wondering. So CT scans, X-rays, uh, MRIs, ultrasounds, those kind of things. I'm the doctor that reads those and, and puts a report on wow. those studies. Yeah. Yeah, as we were mentioning, a lot has happened in the markets, uh, both in equities and um, crypto, Bitcoin, also the ETF launched, which is a big milestone. Um, but uh, as well as that, a lot of price volatility uh, in the markets, um, the equity markets on some relentless up motion mm -hmm. at the moment, apart from, uh, I mean, today's Friday the 5th, yesterday we had some selling off, but it's the first time I've seen that in a, in a long time. I think it's probably the worst day of the year. Um, just coming back to the Bitcoin ETF, I just wanted to know what your thoughts are on the price action since since the launch. How significant is this for Bitcoin uh, and its future? Sure. So it's a good question. I, I would say, you know, I've been in Bitcoin since about 2015, 2016, somewhere in there, although I didn't really understand it until probably 2018, 2019. So um, I like to say I'm the class of 2015, but I got held back till the class of 2019. <laughs> so um, anyways, um, the we've been talking about spot Bitcoin ETFs and, and, and a broader concept of Wall Street adoption of Bitcoin for quite a while. And so to me, this was just basically the inevitable next step for Bitcoin. Um, it's it's always it, it was always going to happen this way. And it finally did happen. So that caused some uh, excitement. And that's great. Um, I think a lot of people who see this, I would say, are over optimistic. And maybe it's because I've just been around a long time and I'm getting kind of old now. So. I've, I've, I've seen it. I've seen enough cycles to see how it works. I think this is very much setting the stage for the next bull market, which we're still which still hasn't started yet, according to me. Um, I think it starts kind of in the second half of 2024 and then extends into 2025. This Wall Street involvement through ETFs, I think, will be the uh, a huge driver of the price increases during what I expect to be the next bull market. I don't think it leads to hyper Bitcoinization, as some people talk about. I think they think we're going to see this runaway price action. You know, it's going to hit a million dollars and never look back. Those kind of things. To me, that's just moon boy, pie in the sky, hopium. Not true at all. I just think this is this is just how it is. So the good thing that it does is it basically makes it very easy for the baby boomer population who has been just only mildly, if at all, interested in Bitcoin to date. Um, now they have an easy one button uh, selection uh, option to just to, to start to, to put a little bit of their portfolio into Bitcoin. Baby boomers have about seventy-five trillion dollars of assets. I was going to say here in the U.S. It's crazy, isn't it? It's I mean, crazy. It's, it's Yep. The percentage share they've got is just gigantic. Yes, they are the largest and wealthiest generation that US, the, the United States has ever seen. So there's a lot of that money that isn't even yet exposed to Bitcoin and will start getting exposed. I think they will start to FOMO in uh, probably the end of this year, but more likely uh, as 2025 rolls on and that Bitcoin bull market rolls on. I think that's when we see a significant uh, move higher for basically the baby boomers getting into Bitcoin. And I think their primary vehicle will be through these ETFs. And who who um, who's going to entice them into the ETFs? Is that finance? Are we talking financial advisors and the old sort of classic that that you know they give advice and then suddenly that you know they, they put a percentage allocation to Bitcoin? All of it. So so the, the 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 primary driver, as always, is the price action. They're going to see in the papers and on CNBC and Bloomberg and Opto and uh, you know talking to their neighbors. They're going to see these massive price increases, and that's. 
That's the number one driver of FOMO. The second is Larry Fink is leading the way in showing investment advisors how to talk about Bitcoin. I actually think he gets it now. I was skeptical of him a year ago uh, and just thought, well, he's just in it to, to you know, glean management fees off of Bitcoin because he sees that it's inevitable. I think he's actually like coming full circle and, and starting to really understand Bitcoin now. So to me, he's really paving the way. Michael Saylor is helping a lot with the way they talk about it as being basically a, a store of value. It's a way to protect yourself from the debasing dollar, from this, uh, you know, the runaway credit and debt that the United States and other Western nations are issuing. Um, it's just a way to, to, to protect and grow your purchasing power. And that's a great framing for it. Um, and so, yes, I do think that financial advisors are going to start talking about it. We're already seeing them. They're being forced to talk about it on these stations. I think there are a lot of these guys and gals were hoping to never have to talk about it. They were hoping mm -hmm. to keep Bitcoin in the closet and like, you know, it's just for crazy people and it's, you know, it's used by criminals and it wastes energy and it's boiling the oceans and all that FUD. Um, they were hoping to just keep it over there. But now because it's mainstream now, they're being forced to talk about it and forced to expose, I think, their ignorance about Bitcoin. So um, it's here to stay now. It's officially you know, accepted by the SEC. It's officially a part of uh, the investment advisory and, and uh, fund management world. And so more and more people are gonna have to get on board. And then finally, um, the longer people avoid getting on board and continue to use, you know, recycle old FUD and these ridiculous old narratives about Bitcoin, the longer the, the longer they're going to fall behind and the further they're going to fall behind as far as investment returns go. So th their clients are going to leave them and they're going to start um, learning quickly as they as they have a flood of AUM leave uh, their establishments that they've had for decades. Um, that's that's going to be a huge wake up call for a lot of them, I think. And so we've got the baby boomers. Um, and what about institutional money? So pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, hedge funds, et cetera. Um, do you see them adopting Bitcoin more than they were before from the ETF? And I do. Has that started happening? I do. It has started happening. It's still only just a tiny little trickle. I, I want to be very clear on that. What, it, what I guarantee is happening right now is they're having meetings right now. So, so you know, they have their investment committees. There's however many, four, six, eight, 10, 12 people sitting around talking about it. And there's a growing minority of people who are pro Bitcoin. And a lot of people could easily just poo poo it and say, it's too much of a hassle. How are we going to deal with the custodian issue? Like, are we going to put it in cold storage? Like, that's crazy. Like, it was very challenging to do before. But now, because of these spot Bitcoin ETFs, it's just a one click custody solution. Very easy for them. And I think what got me into Bitcoin way back in 2015 or 2016, sorry, I can't, I can't remember the exact year, but uh, what got me into it was the sharp ratio, the risk adjusted returns that Bitcoin offers still are off the charts. They're still much better than any other major asset class. And so it's getting to be at this point a uh, detriment to your career if you continue to hold an anti-Bitcoin stance and don't put it in your portfolio. Um, people are going to start asking questions and asking, why would you not have the, the asset class that is SEC approved and Wall Street approved and has the best sharp ratio, the best risk adjusted returns of any other major asset class? Why in the world don't you have at least a small exposure to that in your portfolio? Those are the kind mm -hmm. of questions that are being asked right now. I mean, the returns over the last sort of 10 years have been the best of any asset class, I think. There's yep. that, you know, that chart going around, but by some, some mar margin. Yes. Um, do you, do you think uh, Bitcoin's now being considered as, as a hedge against inflation or are we still in this uh, scenario where it's still acting like a tech stock? There are. So that's what's so interesting about Bitcoin, right? There are, I think there are many stages to, un to understanding Bitcoin. I kind of famously tweeted this a few years ago that I think it starts stage one is speculation, like, excuse me, is skepticism. You just don't believe in it. You think it's for kooks and criminals and, and geeks and all that. Stage two is speculation. You use it as a trade because of this incredible volatility and the chance for gains. Stage three is it as an investment or as a hedge. And so I think a lot of people, after they study it for a while, start to see it as a longer term investment or, as you say, a hedge against inflation. Um, but I think it's more than that. I think stage four in the final stage is you just see it as a superior savings technology. So that's yeah. really what it does. It's meant to store. Uh, it's, to, it's meant to be a store of value, a, an appreciator of purchasing power over time. 
And it clearly does that when you look back and you take the 30,000 foot view and look at what it does. What people got very confused at around the COVID time period from like 2020 to 2022, people thought it was a CPI, like a price inflation hedge. And so they, everybody talked, well, you know, it went down and prices went up, you lie. You know, and that's not what we're talking about. Most Bitcoiners understand what they're talking about. We're talking about it's a monetary debasement hedge. And that's a long-term phenomenon. So as the Western nations continue to expand their credit and monetary supply, by definition, because we have a, a scarce amount of, of resources, right, the prices of everything are going to go up over time. So the currency unit debases over time. Those two things are interrelated, the CPI and monetary debasement, but they're, they're interrelated over the long term. In the short term, CPI can fluctuate greatly. Uh, and so, of, of course, Bitcoin doesn't track that on a short term movement, but as a long term debasement hedge, it absolutely works very well. And I think it's more than a hedge. And that's what I'm trying to get at with people who understand Bitcoin and study it longer. Not only is it, is it a hedge, uh, it's, a, it's literally an alternative. It's, a, it's an alternative monetary and financial system that, I, that is running parallel to the current fiat world right now. And as the fiat world continues to expand uh, to unsustainable levels, more and more of that purchasing power is going to shift over into the Bitcoin monetary and financial network. And so we're watching mm -hmm. that happen in real time. It's going to be clunky and ugly for, I think, several decades. Um, but to me, it's just an inevitable um, progression. And, and we're going to eventually completely trans transition, not just as individuals, but as companies and as nation states are going to trans over, transition over to the Bitcoin network, I think, uh, in the coming decades. And you've said, uh, on Twitter recently, you said uh, Bitcoin can be the key to fixing your health. I thought I'd just touch on that and see if you could uh, yeah, dive into that a bit more. Sure. So again, now putting my doctor hat on these things back here. So, so when I think about what stresses people, so for, let me one step further. What causes health problems for most people, especially in the Western world, where we have, you know, general abundance uh, in general, people have what they need. They have enough food. Um, they have shelter, those kind of things. So, you know, um, there's not a lot of um, uh, major economic issues from that standpoint uh, in the U.S. and in developed nations. The major cause of stress is, I would argue, actually debasing currency and that most people would never think that. But, but why do I say that? Most people are very concerned about how they are going to pay their bills. People talk all the time about living paycheck to paycheck. We talk all the time about inflation, how the cost of groceries and gas and healthcare and education have just gone absolutely bananas over the last couple of decades. And people can't even afford it anymore. There's a, a decimation of the middle class. And now there are two segments of people, right? There's two Americas, as we like to say. There's the people in the upper crust who are doing well and benefiting from like interest rate policies and rising stock markets and, and things like that. And then there are people in the lower income half who are really, really struggling and continue to struggle. As you struggle financially, that's very stressful. Stress, as people know, and more people have begun to understand, has significant health effects, deleterious health effects. So uh, what do I mean by that? Causes uh, risks of heart disease, risks of just vascular disease in general, risk of um, cancer, um, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, all these things that are kind of interlinked. They are all related to, I think, this stressful, sedentary lifestyle that we have in, in the Western world. And again, probably most commonly here in the United States. Um, there are a lot of other reasons and we could get into nutrition and all that kind of stuff and lack of exercise. But the stress that the monetary system causes, I think, is pervasive. It's totally widespread and it's terrible for your health. Uh, and so why do I say Bitcoin fixes health? Because it's it turns the current fiat system completely on its head. If you don't have to think about, you know, if I, you know, for people who have to work two jobs or three jobs just to pay the bill who are living paycheck to paycheck, what if they could go back to just working one job and be able to support their family? What if you didn't have to have a dual income, husband and wife both working, uh, and you don't even have time for kids because you're so busy trying to work, trying to pay the bills, you know, just trying to pay the rent and pay for your groceries? What if you had money that you, that, appreciated in purchasing power over time so that you didn't also have to be a master investor and speculator in your free time. You didn't have to speculate in crypto and speculate in tech stocks and meme stocks uh, because your purchasing power is draining so quickly and you can't keep up with the expenses of life. So all of those things are very deleterious to your health. Um, and, and I've just been watching that for 40 years and watching the population of America get more and more unhealthy, more and more obese. I think the latest stats I've seen is that um, 
eighty percent of Americans are either overweight or or actually obese. Wow. Um, that's pretty impressive, right? And that's very, very, very unhealthy. And there are multiple; re- it's multifactorial for sure. But one of the things that can help with that is this: if you can get rid of that stress, if you can free up more time when you have money that actually is inflationary and debasing. It's actually stealing your time. It forces you to work more. It forces you to grind it out, to stay on the hamster wheel longer and longer just in order to pay your bills and hopefully someday retire, although most people won't ever see any kind of retirement, not, not, not in any meaningful way. Bitcoin is the opposite of that, and it frees up your time. It gives you your time back. It enables you to be less stressed out about the future, to be less stressed out about your kids and your grandkids. You can start thinking long term. It's called having a low time preference uh, versus thinking about today, the here and now uh, and all of all of the uh, negative effects that that implies. So it's it's kind of philosophical. Um, I think that what I would like to see as a physician, I want to see data start coming out that actually shows that because I think it, it from just anecdotal evidence from knowing people who have basically moved over onto a Bitcoin standard. And I see the calmness in them. I see how healthy they are. I see the time uh, that they have this free time where suddenly they're doing what they love. They enjoy the work that they do. They don't they've gotten off of the fiat hamster wheel. I, I, I can't say this without the evidence to support me, but anecdotally, I see that it's increasing lifespan, it's increasing health. And I think that as more studies come on and as Bitcoin actually catches on around the world, we're going to see a worldwide movement where everything has been getting progressively unhealthy. I think we're going to start seeing this shift and this transition back to a healthier world where people start living longer, start focusing on their health in their nutrition uh, and have more free time again. And, I, and uh, I'm just excited for that world. I don't, it's going to be tough for us to see in our generation, but for my kids and my grandkids, I think that's the world that they're going to inherit. Yeah. And that's really exciting to me. That's good. Yeah, that is good. And then a question would be why, why is the government debasing the currency? Why, why are they, you could say abusing their power to do that? What is the benefit for society for them doing that? Or is this just something that successful nations end up, doing? So I would argue that it's a huge benefit. So first of all, whoever controls the money, money is power, right? So whoever controls the production and the disbursement of money has the power. Um, That has been basically purely the government since, uh, you could argue, since we left the gold standard in 1971. Since money became fiat, meaning meaning it wasn't tied to gold, it wasn't tied to any actual um, unit of account. It was just basically the full faith and credit of the United States government. Uh, And that's what it's been since 1971. And, And since the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency, Uh, and the basis for the majority of transactions. That means the entire world has been on this fiat standard uh, since since the early 1970s. Um, That that dishonest uh, measuring stick benefits somebody and it hurts other people. So who does it benefit? It benefits the government. What should happen? And Jeff Booth, I don't know if you've ever interviewed Jeff Booth. He, he's the, uh, yeah, so the price, the price of Tomorrow author. He's a friend of mine. He's just a great guy. He does a great job explaining this. As long as human progress is occurring, as long as technology is increasing, we should see our prices of everything uh, going down and we should see the quality of everything go higher. But what happens is the government basically takes that through inflationary policies. So basically what they're doing is they're taking our purchasing power by spending more than they actually make in effect, uh, spending faster than the, than the economy is growing. That causes this debasement in the currency overall, and it takes the purchasing power. So the gains that humanity should be seen are basically being sucked up by governments, and especially by the U.S. government as the most powerful government and the controller of the currency. That's why I get, this to me is like the number one problem in the world today. It's why we see such massive inequalities. It's why we see huge nation states that basically have unlimited, almost infinite power, right? I mean, the US could blow up the world 20 times over today if we wanted to. And we, you know, I mean, the the amount of military might is, I would say, ridiculous compared to what is necessary. Um, and so, so that, and that's a whole, and I'm not even trying to be political, right? I'm not, I'm not anti-government, but what I am is I'm anti the government stealing the purchasing power through fiat currency of its citizens. I think that is actually criminal. And so what Bitcoin does because it's decentralized and secure is it takes that gain in purchasing power and it distributes it to the people who use it. It distributes it across the Bitcoin network. Um, And so what we see is because it's a neutral money, it has this fixed monetary supply. 
all it does is it just accurately measures the progress of humanity. So as costs naturally go towards zero over time, um, that will be reflected in the in in the price of Bitcoin. So what I like to talk about in Bitcoin is not just number go up technology, which most people get excited about. Speculators, traders, even investors get super excited about that. I like to think about it as prices go down technology. So over time, the longer you hold Bitcoin, the cheaper life actually gets. It's really amazing. Even in this age of this great inflation where everybody's talking about, you can show charts of everything across the board and look look at the price of housing in Bitcoin. Look at the price of food in Bitcoin. I post every month and because the Federal Reserve actually on their site, the St. Louis uh, Federal <laughs> Reserve, the FRED site, they yeah. have a page that's the price of bit, pricing Bitcoin, uh, pricing eggs in Bitcoin, and they've been tracking this since the beginning. You've probably seen it. They've they've been tracking this since the beginning of 2015, and it shows in the price of well, in the price of dollars, the price has been chopping and going a little bit higher over time, uh, as you would expect. And in the price of Bitcoin, it started up here and it's gone down in this line. Basically, you can't even see the line anymore, so it's gone down. It's trending <laughs> towards zero over time. And people think this is some kind of gimmick and they think maybe they missed it just because Bitcoin had this, you know, huge decade last decade. I'm telling you that this will happen for the rest of our lives, that the prices of everything will go down in Bitcoin terms over the long mm -hmm. run. And that is the magic of Bitcoin. And it, in the who hates it? The government. Why? Because they control the, the creation and distribution of the currency units. They get to reap the benefits of that. They get to take the purchasing power that I would say they're stealing from their citizens, that the yep. citizens should be benefiting from. They're taking it and getting bloated and obnoxious and, and you know way too powerful. Bitcoin is slowly taking that back and giving it back to the people of the world. And to me, that's super exciting. And to me, it's worth talking about, teaching about and fighting for. Yeah, very interesting future potentially for coming up, even though we've got yeah all this uh, problems with, with purchasing power. Yep. Bitcoin seems to be a, a good solution to it. Um, moving on to the halving and probably like your outlook for the next 12 to 18 months. You, you mentioned, you know, you've already mentioned the second half of the year you think is going to be interesting. But um, do you think that there's going to be any imp impact around the halving? Do you think um, this cycle is any different because of the ETF or is it not? Do you see the, the you know, do you see the typical cycle playing out? Yeah, good question. So, so uh, first of all, I, I like to not make predictions. I make observations based on past cycles. So I'm a, I'm a patterns guy and I'm a um, kind of a momentum direction sort of guy. So what I like to look at is what has Bitcoin done in the past? I would argue that it's basically, it's, it's arguably mathematical, the price increases that we've seen in Bitcoin and these just strange behavior um, almost seems mathematical, I would argue. Why do I say that? What we see in Bitcoin in the past is that after the past bull market highs back in 2013 and 2017, at the following halvings after those highs, the price of Bitcoin was about 50 to 60 percent of the recent highs. OK, so keep that in mind. 2021 happened. And I'm going to argue that 2021 was an anomaly, that the price of Bitcoin mm -hmm. should have gone much higher than it did, um, but it didn't. And why? It, so a couple of reasons. The price went to about 69,000, let's call it 70,000 just for easy math. If Bitcoin followed the previous cycles of getting to 50 to 60% of its previous high at the next halving, we should see a price of Bitcoin at 50 to 60% of 70,000, which would be about 35,000 to 42,000, right? That's not what's happening. And, and what, what I've been arguing since 2021, actually, since China did what they did, and, and so go way back, remember the spring of 2021, what happened? China came out outright and said, we are, it, we are banning Bitcoin mining. We think it's bad for the environment. We're having this drought problem, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's wasting resources. It's illegal to mine Bitcoin in China. What happened? The hash rate literally dropped in half within a month. The price also followed. Why did the price fall? I think it's because all of these Bitcoin miners were, so, you know, not only did they, they stop their hash rate just out of the blue, just like that, they were forced sellers of their Bitcoin. They had to get rid of it. There was this massive selling pressure on the price of Bitcoin. It dropped it from around 65,000 or so to around 30,000 or so. And, and I'm a little bit off on the numbers. That, that happened right as the bull market was, was starting to really heat up in 2021. And so that's why I call it an anomaly. The price then tried to rebound and we had a double top. Basically, it went back up to about 69,000 or so in, I believe, November of 2021 before it rolled over again, finally. If that hadn't happened, I think that was like a legitimate kick to the shorts 
uh, for Bitcoin. Like that was literally out of left field. I mean, you're, you're, they just came in and just smashed half of the, the hash rate a, away and just said, you know, you're out yeah. of here. That's a big hit. Now, obviously, Bitcoin, the network functioned just fine. There, there were no issues in how it worked for the users of Bitcoin. Um, it just caused that temporary price dip. So I bring up why do I bring all this up? If that hadn't happened, I would argue that the price of Bitcoin should have gone to about $125,000 back in November of 2021 based on just prior cycles and repeating patterns. Um, if that were the case, and I would argue that it is, that that was an anomaly. You, now we have $125,000 in our, in our heads. Now we're approaching the having. What should the price be? I would argue it should be 50 to 60% of $125,000 which puts us at 62,500 to $75,000, somewhere in that range, which is exactly where we are as we're recording this at 67,700 US dollars. Perfect, it's right in the range. That's not a prediction, that's just an observation based on uh, what I think should have happened in 2021 and then looking back at past cycles. Cause so yeah, then, yeah, so, that, so, so to me, like, I, I don't really care if it goes far above it or far below it. I would just say it's kind of a little bit of an anomaly if it does too, if it goes too far below that range or too far above it. Tons of people have been calling for 100K before having. I've been saying, man, I hope you're right, but I just don't think so at all. I think you're too optimistic based on the data. And I just continue to hold that view. Um, so, so then uh, you're talking about after the having. After the having, what we typically see somewhere like around just before the having or immediately after the having, we have kind of a buy the rumor, sell the news type event. So people get you know really excited into the having that tends to push the price higher. And then there's this kind of letdown because everybody's waiting to see this price skyrocket, but there's no buyers left because everybody bought into the having. So what I actually expect to happen based, again, this isn't a prediction, it's based on what has happened in the past. So it's just me looking at patterns in the past. In the past, it's not abnormal to see a high uh, uh, at the halving or just, pro just prior to the halving, maybe a month or so before. And then the price can actually drop 30 to 40% from there. So, so my price range expectations for the coming months, like basically as we head into May and June or so, I think we could see Bitcoin fall all the way down about 40% from this recent high of about 74,000. It could drop about 40% down to about 45,000 or 44,000. Wow. That would be totally normal. It would still be totally within the normal range. In fact, I'll be surprised if we don't see a bit of a pullback. I don't think we go right to 100K or 500K or a million, as some people are suggesting, because of this incredible buying power from the spot Bitcoin ETFs. I just don't think that's going to happen. So, so. I'm expecting, and what I tell my own investors, I I've written several uh, letters to them uh, regarding this, temper your expectations. Uh, I, I think it's gonna be kind of a disappointing spring and summer for the price of Bitcoin. But then the good news is, is I think that finally sets the stage for the start of the next bull market. Um, as we head into the late summer months, and I, I've targeted Michael Jackson's birthday, which is August 29th, um, just for fun. Uh, it, it, there's nothing magical about that date, but that's kind of about the time frame where I think things start getting exciting again. And as we head into the final months of 2024, I think the bull market starts in earnest, again, just based on past cycle behavior. Um, so may, uh, maybe we'll be backed by, uh, you know, Fed policy, central bank policy, maybe global M2 will really be increasing again, which tends to be uh, strongly correlated to the price of Bitcoin. Why that would happen, I'm not totally sure why, uh, other than that the, the economic cycle is turning again. It looks like it's bottomed and is starting to head higher again. All of those things that are currently now, they're not headwinds, but they're basically not any type of winds. They're sideways winds, crab-like crab winds uh, for the price of Bitcoin. I think that they'll get behind Bitcoin as we head into late 2024 and 2025, and that will be what's going to help propel Bitcoin to much higher levels. I think we get to uh, at least 100K by Christmas Day, probably more like 125K or more. Again, that 125K, which is what I think the old price target should have been. Um, it's possible if it's based on past cycles that we hit that by around Halloween of this year, kind of uh, October 31st-ish. Um, I like to be a little more conservative. So I say by Christmas Day, 100, 125K by Christmas Day. And then I think it's off to the races. As we head into 2025, I'm very optimistic. Um, I, I, I Again, price targets, who care? Who, you know, what are they worth? Nothing. It's just a guess. This is not individual investment advice. I'm only guessing. But based on past cycles, I think 475,000 for a peak target sometime in the fourth quarter of 2025, I think is reasonable. Uh, it could be conservative. It might go quite a bit higher than that. Um, but we'll see. And that's around 18 months after the halving, which is typical, is it? This is like when the, the peak sort of happens for the, from the last two cycles. So you yep. think that will play out pretty, pretty much identical again? 
I do. And again, people are like, oh, you can't predict fu- the future based on the past. And I, I agree with that. But but again, as a pattern and a trend guy, I, I'm of the opinion that until something changes, I'm going to assume that the pattern is correct. So so it yeah. could it could break out one way or the other. Uh, and I'm like, OK, so it broke out and the pattern has changed. But until it's changed, I'm going to hold to that. So if it follows the previous patterns, that's where I get my 475 to $500,000 peak level in Q4. And then, by the way, I, and then I, I always like to emphasize this because people always like to talk about how high could it go. I like to think more as a conservative guy, how low could it go? So if we do have a parabolic move higher, then I would expect it to be really ugly again into 2026. Um, yeah. And so my low target for the fourth quarter of 2026 is about seventy thousand dollars. Right. In fact, interestingly, right about where it is today, I feel like we're forming the next base right now. This price target where it keeps ramping from about sixty five to seventy five K or so. To me, that will be the floor of the next bear market. Um, so that's just, again, my prediction. And for people who are just super excited and they're all going to pile in when Bitcoin's at three hundred K or four hundred K or five hundred K. Just be prepared for another sharp, severe drawdown that's going to yeah. you know, make you uh, make you hate Bitcoin and wish you hadn't FOMO'd in at the top. <laughs> and that period can last another 18 months or so, isn't it? I think I think it's around that. Usually before, from, I think yeah, yeah, usually from peak to trough, it's about 12 months or so. Um, okay. But, you know, that can vary a little bit too. So we'll see. Yeah, yeah. yeah very interesting. So, and someone else you commented on uh, that's related. Why do you believe MicroStrategy is the only publicly traded asset that has the potential to outperform Bitcoin in the medium to long term. Is that is that still a valid statement? It is. I still haven't seen any other company that I think can outperform Bitcoin. Why do I think MicroStrategy can? So everybody knows the concept of beta, right? Like if an a, a asset, the stock market is trading at one, if, if another asset is correlated, but it, it, it has more volatility, it has a higher beta. Yeah. I think of MicroStrategy not only as beta to Bitcoin, but I think it's smart beta. So as long as you have Michael Saylor at the helm, and I think of him as basically a master capital allocator, he's similar to Warren Buffett in the fiat world. I think to me, to me, investing in microstrategy is sort of like uh, jumping on board with Berkshire Hathaway back in like 1970. Um, you just trust him that he's a master capital allocator. He's in the right place at the right time. He's doing this. I call it a speculative arbitrage on the dollar by he, whenever he can get um, cheap dollars to buy Bitcoin with. He takes advantage yeah. of it, whether that's through s- selling shares of his company or whether it's through cheap debt. He's super smart, right? And if you're at a negotiating table with him, he's at least as smart as whoever is sitting across the table from him. And he's probably more intelligent. And he's talking about his company and the mechanics of his company that he's owned and operated for over 25 years, maybe 30 years or so. So the dude knows what he's doing. And he's obviously, you know, very smart about Bitcoin. So if, like me, you believe in the long term success of Bitcoin, it's the most obvious thing in the world to do what he's doing. And I think Mm -hmm. all companies, public and private, should be following his lead. I think that balance sheet management is the most important aspect of company uh, ownership and operations that has ever been in the history of companies. Uh, So so it's been a relatively insignificant thing to think about um, in the past. But I think currently, if you have chief financial officers who don't have a Bitcoin strategy, you're destined to fall far behind Bitcoin related companies. So that's my personal take. I've said, and I've said this, it's, it's about a year and a half ago that I wrote this back when the price of MicroStrategy was down in the dumps for just a couple hundred dollars. I said by 2033, I think MicroStrategy will be the largest public company in the world by market cap. Um, And it still has a long ways to go, but man, it has gone a long ways, uh, much, much higher. In fact, it's now 300 something. uh, And back then it was, I don't even know, maybe the 1000 or or below a thousand. So it was kind of a bold call. I got a lot of flack for it, but I still hold true to that. And I still think, again, if you believe what Bitcoin is going to do and you see the intelligent beta strategy that Microseller is doing, I don't see how you can think otherwise. It's going to grow so much faster than any other company who's relying on their operating earnings mm-hmm. uh, to propel them forward. So, just my and just my opinion. What what are the what are the reasons why it has the beta compared to Bitcoin? Because obviously, he continues to buy more Bitcoin, so he's yep. he's increasing his stack all the time. Um, but also, I've heard uh, still a lot of investment funds that can only invest in equities, not ETFs. And it's a logical choice for that. I don't know what else you go into if you want to invest in Bitcoin, but can't buy the ETF. Um, 
What, any other reasons why? It's more about why it's it's more about the leverage that they use and when they decide to deploy it, right? So he's being smart about it. Again, I bring up Warren Buffett because lots of companies do stock buybacks, but very few companies do it well. Lots of companies build cash hoards, but very few of them save them for just the perfect time, right at the bottom of a you know the global financial crisis where Buffett was there with tons of cash ready to buy desperate companies with you know asking for desperate measures. This is what Sailor is doing, and that's why I think he's so brilliant. It's not just leverage to Bitcoin, it's smart leverage to Bitcoin. So he knows when his share prices are way overvalued relative to Bitcoin, and so he issues more shares, and he, and he takes these wildly overvalued shares and buys undervalued, relatively speaking, Bitcoin. When he can get debt for less than 1%, I mean, we live in a 5% uh, interest rate world right now, and he's getting debt right now for less than 1%, like 0.65, yeah. you know, 0.8% rates right now. How is he able to get that? Just because they're, they're markets, they're for people because they, he's doing them through sort of convertible notes most of the time. Okay, so people, okay. you know, they have the debt exposure, but they also have some equity upside exposure. Mm -hmm. um, so he captures that and he realized that there are a lot of bondholders who can't have access to Bitcoin. He's making a way for bondholders to have have access to Bitcoin and to appreciate, okay, okay. to get some of that upsize equity appreciation. Um, so he's just brilliant in that way. And again, I don't, I'm not gushing over him. I'm just saying like, as a guy who follows companies and, and I, I've, I'm always looking for the world's best capital allocators. I haven't found anybody since Buffett. And now I believe it is Michael Saylor. And as long as he is at the helm of MicroStrategy, uh, betting, investing alongside of him, is almost the easiest no-brainer decision to make, in my opinion. Um, yeah. So anyways, I'll stop there. And what about the miners? Do, how do you see them playing out over the, that same period, the 12 to 18 months? So miners are the original beta to Bitcoin, right? They, they are the original, like as Bitcoin rises, they rise up severely. And as Bitcoin falls, they fall severely. I don't view Bitcoin miners as a good long-term investment. They're just way too volatile. And there's it's a dog-eat-dog. -dog. It's a terrible business. For people who understand anything about any kind of commodity mining, it's dog eat dog. It's terrible. You do not want to be in the mining business of any kind. And that includes Bitcoin mining, right? Because you can buy the world's best equipment. You can make these massive like, allocations to it, but you can screw it up from an operation standpoint. You can have your equipment go bad. You can quickly have your equipment become obsoleted by newer technology. And suddenly the stuff that was an asset to you is now more of a liability. And it's thing after thing after thing. And so you can make mistakes along the way. So I think it's unlikely that miners can outperform Bitcoin over the long run. And I think we've seen that so far. I will say with the caveat, though, during a bull market, they are likely to outperform Bitcoin just because they are they have that extra volatility and they tend to be sort of a speculative asset relative to Bitcoin. So I'm generally constructive on miners during a Bitcoin bull market, but I definitely would not recommend to anybody to hold miners for the long run unless they somehow change their business policies and their operations policy. And I don't. I don't really see how they could do that effectively. Do you see uh, any of the miners? I mean, I, know, I don't know how in depth you, you, you go on top of them, but you could see a logical play for them if they're thinking more long term is to hold on to more Bitcoin and do a similar strategy to MicroStrategy and Michael Saylor. Yeah, so, it, doing that so so uh, I think so. The first inkling I've seen of that first first of all, there are several miners who do have a, bit, a holding Bitcoin policy, right? Uh, Marathon and I think Hut Eight have a lot of Bitcoin on their balance sheet. They've done okay as far as I'm concerned, as far as managing that. I think Hut Eight has done kind of a worse job, and Marathon's done a little better job. Um, Clean Spark, I believe, just issued some shares when they were fairly highly priced, which caused a lot of consternation. But if they use that to buy Bitcoin, I would say that's actually smart. That's smart beta right there. So if the, if they if they do basically a sailor strategy, yes, then they would be more interesting, and I think they're likely to outperform. All of this stuff, like people say, like is is leverage good or is it bad? Is it good or bad to sell shares? You know, to to offer more shares to buy Bitcoin. It just completely depends. It depends when you do it. It depends on the terms you get. If you can get super cheap debt at just the right time to buy undervalued Bitcoin, relatively speaking, um, then yeah, it's really smart to do that. If you go at the end of the bull market cycle, say when the price of Bitcoin is five hundred thousand. And you take out a huge debt at 10% interest because it only go because Bitcoin only goes up, you're going to get wrecked and you're going to go out of business and you're going to go bankrupt and that's a horrible business decision. So, I look at it like you it's it's just it's very complicated uh, and you have to really look through these kind of details to see like are they really making good decisions and then on top of it are they making good operating decisions 
Do they have cheap? Uh, do they have steady access to very cheap energy? Are they making very large profits during the Bitcoin bull market? If they are, what are they doing with that? Are they holding their Bitcoin? Are they selling it to raise money? Um, are they trying to expand too quickly? Uh, that's another thing. Credit is usually widely available during the bull markets, but that's actually not when you really want to take loans out. Um, because you're sort of approaching the end of the cycle and it can turn against you as the cycle turns. Um, so I look for companies that make really smart financial decisions at the top of bull markets and at the bottom of bear markets. And those are the ones who can do well over the long run. And I would say from my um, observations, there are very few Bitcoin miners that do both of those things well. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. And um, I thought we could wrap up by just having a, a bit of a chat about the macro um and obviously yep yeah, a lot of stuff going on this year it's election year um things have been pretty good start of the year for for, for equities uh, as we talked about at the start of the show a uh, little bit of a wobble yesterday we had jobs numbers today which were actually surprised up they were good mm-hmm. um although digging into it i think there's a lot to take in from that i think government continues to employ a, a lot of people on the in those job numbers and I believe something along the lines of um, this something about illegal immigrants getting jobs and they don't classify it differently and it gets wrapped into that number as well. As I, I, I don't know if you've seen that, Jeff, but it's something I read on, on Twitter earlier. But uh, what's, what's your outlook for the year? What, what do you think is going to happen uh, based on where we're at today? Sure, sure. So I don't have an opinion on that because I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, and I haven't, I haven't even read the headline, so I'm not sure about that. I do say from what I follow is I think the economy is strong. I think that the U.S. has basically sidestepped a recession. Uh, To me, it was clear that most of Europe and China endured a recession for a a time and a a real serious period of economic weakness. But even they are, to me, it looks like bottoming and starting to rise out of it. I think that the chance for the U.S. to hit a recession has come and gone, and we've officially pushed it into the future. So probably late 2025, 2026 sometime is probably the next time we'll see that. And I base that off of how business cycles uh, tend to move in this sort of sine wave fashion. And I think we've you know, hit the bottom and we're starting to head back up again. So a recession, I would say, is very unlikely. To me, that means that we're generally in a bullish type market. We're not in a true, um, just wildly bullish type setup. I don't think we're going to be there for quite a while. The main reason for that uh, is we're not supported by liquidity yet. So two indicators that I follow closely are what are global M2, what's the global M2 money supply doing, and what is U.S. net liquidity doing? I'll start with U.S. net liquidity. So U.S. net liquidity, for, for your listeners who don't know, it's basically the Fed balance sheet minus what's in the overnight reverse repo market minus what's on the Treasury general account. And when you take that number, um, uh, you get what's called the U.S. net liquidity. And what's interesting about that is there's a very strong correlation to what U.S. based assets do. And so what do I mean by that? U.S. small cap stocks, mid cap stocks and micro cap stocks almost perfectly follow what the course of U.S. net liquidity does. So that has been range bound for three years now. We're in the third year of basically a chopping in this range. It's at the upper end of that range. It keeps like poking against the upper end of the range like it wants to break out, but it doesn't break out. Because it's at the upper end of the range, I go by this moniker on Twitter, or currently I'm Dr. Bullcrab, uh, which is sort of a funny <laughs> saying. So bullish because it's at the upper end, but crabbish because it's still trapped in this sideways pattern until yeah. it breaks out. And I do expect it at some point to break out to the upside. Then I will become bullish because we'll have U.S. net liquidity supporting U.S. based assets. So that's the U.S. Two is uh, global M2 supply. Global M2 monetary supply tends to... Um, I would say influence the direction or at least moves in proportion to what you, excuse me, of what global assets do. The most common are Bitcoin, gold, uh, and um, actually U.S. mega cap tech stocks. Those tend to be kind of considered global assets for the world. They move generally and they correlate with what global M2 is doing. Global M2, similar to U.S. net liquidity, has been range bound. It's only been range bound for about two years but it is also at the top end of this range trying to break higher, but it just can't break higher. Um, and so I'm waiting for that to finally break free. Once it does, I'll, I'll stop calling myself Dr. Bullcrab and I'll finally just be Dr. Bull uh, because now we have the, <laughs> because now we'll have the tailwinds of liquidity behind us for the price of for the prices of assets. 
I think we'll know when that happens because the price of Bitcoin will finally break out. I think that will be the impetus that will help push it above 125K and start yeah. the, the run, the parabolic move. Uh, and we'll also see it being reflected, I think, in equities. I think we're going to see another pretty significant leg higher, possibly similar to the late 1990s, um, where the Fed, you know, that if, and, and just as a reminder, I've been talking about this for like a year. I think the situation we're in closely, a lot of people talk about the 1970s. I don't think we're in the 1970s. I think we're closer to the 1990s. The Fed had raised rates and then they kind of held it for a while. And then they lowered it a little bit and just kind of sat there and teased it around. And then what happened is the markets finally, like the economy was lit underneath it and, and risk assets just took off. And we had that huge boom heading into the end of the 1990s. I think it's very possible we have a similar situation this time around that for the next year or two, risk assets look around and they're like, I guess we're not having a recession. Like, what were we worried about? Let's go. And, and suddenly investors go all yeah. in on risk assets and all in on Bitcoin. And and I think that's what pushes us much higher. And it's going to be a rough recession on the other side, but we're we're a long ways away from that at this point. And is there a particular catalyst, do you think, for pushing that liquidity equation up? Is it the Fed cutting rates or something like this? Not really. I don't think the Fed matters that much right now. I think, you know, what, the, what I see with the Fed funds rate and with inflation, which I think is just going to remain kind of sticky high from here on out, I think 2 to 4% is kind of the new CPI range that I think everybody should just get used to. Sort of like we got used to 0 to 2% throughout the 2010s decade, which was abnormal, by the way. I think it's normal. And so this rate of inflation, kind of two to four percent or so um, and interest rates in sort of the four to five percent range uh, with just kind of a kind of a strong GDP in the U.S. And I think that's going to start being echoed in the rest of the world. Um, to me, these rates are normal. This is a sign of health, not unhealthiness. I don't think the market I think what what's going to happen is there's going to be a disconnect where the markets are finally like, wait, we don't have to totally be dependent on what the central banks do anymore. We can just rip higher because of economic growth, because actually things aren't as bad as people thought they were going to get. Inflation, we can handle 2 to 4% inflation. Interest rates at 5% or so, we can handle 5% inflation rates. Um, uh, we, we don't, like, there, there aren't any major headwinds, and I think that's just going to cause this stair-step function higher of risk assets over the next couple of years. I don't know that there's a major catalyst. Like, I don't think there's going to be a major deflationary bust followed by a huge inflow of central bank liquidity. I just think what we're going to see is global M2 is going to start creeping higher because that's the, the economic engines are going to start in, uh, going higher. I think banks are going to start lending again. That's going to expand the global monetary supply. That expansion will find its way into risk assets, and that's what's going to be the basis of the next move higher. And do you think it's uh, at all concerning the, the levels of U.S. debt? I mean, it's varying opinions on it. Obviously, I think it's $34.5 trillion. It just hit or, or a bit higher than that now. How significant is that? Obviously, they've got to pay the interest payments on those debt. I think it's half of the uh, the income from from taxes that it goes on that now, or something like this. So, is it a problem or not? Or do they, can they just keep on printing their way out of it? So this is an unpopular view uh, because it's not hyperbolic, but I think that it's just business as usual. I think mm -hmm. if you look back at the growth of U.S. debt, and you and and it's very important, by the way, to not watch it on a linear chart, but to look at it on a logarithmic chart. On a log scale, it's basically just doing this. On a linear scale, it goes like this, and then it does a hockey stick higher, and everybody shows pictures of that, and then they freak out and say, we're heading into a crisis. Even among Bitcoiners, who are my family, right? I, I love these people. Lots of them talk about how we're in a debt spiral, which is going to lead to a death spiral, which is going to lead to hyperinflation of the dollar, and which is going to lead to hyper-Bitcoinization in the near term. And I think they're totally wrong. I think we're just business as usual. Debt, debt. So debt to GDP is high and trending higher. And that's that's unfortunate over the long run. And I totally believe that it won't end well. But debt payments to GDP is kind of about average right now. The payments are still relatively low. And even if they do go higher, I would argue that we can handle it. And I would argue that there is a healthy appetite around the world for U.S. Treasury debt. People want these 5% interest rates. Pensions want 5% interest rates for the long run. They're happy with that. And so I don't think it's spiraling out of control. I don't think it's a death spiral. I definitely don't think we're going to see hyperinflation of the U.S. dollar. And unfortunately, well, fortunately, or I would say fortunately, we're not going to see hyper-Bitcoinization because that would mean basically the fiat system is collapsing in real time. Um, I just think it's business as usual and we're going to go about and, mm -hmm. and we're going to figure out how to manage the debt. And at some point it's going to get too high and then we'll have to be we'll, ha we'll have to do forced austerity at some point. 
And that has happened in the past. And I think it's going to happen in the future because humans aren't that stupid. We're sort of stupid, but we're not that stupid. Uh, we're not going to let it all implode. So outside of a major world war, okay, that's, that's the one caveat that I could see changing everything. So say the U.S. gets in a massive world war with China and Russia and we have everybody on one side or the other. Obviously, that could cause hyperinflation and to cause everything to spiral out of control. If we don't have that though, I just think it's business as usual and I'm not at all concerned about it. So uh, my final question is about um, the exponential age. I don't know if you heard, heard about in, you know, the advent of AI and various other technologies coming together. I mean, Arc talks about it a lot uh, and other people like Rao Pal. They sort of uh, imply that this is gonna bring forward an age of like massively increased product productivity and that could uh, we can encounter like really big GDP growth because of that. What are your thoughts on that? Do you see that playing out or uh, has the AI thing been blown out of proportion? I think that they are right on, but I think like most of these uh, world changing technologies, it's going to be too slow at first. And then we're going to be amazed 10 years from now, uh, you know, how fast it and how far it's gone. Is it uh, Bill uh, Gates who had that famous quote, like technology progress is really slow in the first two years and then shockingly fast mm -hmm. in 10 years or something like that. I think that this is just another case. We're seeing this hype cycle where everybody and all they want is anything that has anything to do with AI. And we're, it's almost like another dot com boom right now um, that could continue to me. That's going to be one of the main narratives of this next bull market. Anything AI uh, is going to get you an, an extreme valuation. And like NVIDIA is a great case in point. We're going to see these price to sales ratios that are just like, unbelievable they make your your head hurt in your nose because <laughs> you can't believe how obnoxious and i think it's going to get more obnoxious and so yes i think that continues but then i think we have the the typical fall after the parabolic rise higher we're going to have that you know come to jesus moment where everything comes down and then we see the growth and the real output i think that's where so probably let's say five to ten years from now that's where we see it starting to really impact the world. That's where we see that it actually has where it, where it kind of starts to outweigh the demographic decline that the whole Western world is on. We're going to see that the robotics, the AI led robotics movement and machinery movement is going to start picking up and starting to make up for it from a GDP perspective. So I think they're right, but I think we're definitely in a hype cycle. I think there's definitely a downside in the middle of that hype cycle that people have to like, be ready for. And then, the and then we see the, yep, and then yeah, we see yeah. the benefits after that. <laughs> Well, thanks, Jeff. It's been great to, to catch up again. Thank you for giving us time to do that. Um, anything you want to leave our community with? Uh, well, not really. Thanks for having me on, Ed. I really enjoy our conversations and I appreciate uh, the invite to be back on your show. Yeah, definitely uh, catch Jeff on, on Twitter. What's, can you remind me of your handle? Yeah, again? so my handle is at Cap. That's V-A-I-L-S-H-I-R-E-C-A-P. And then I do run a hedge fund and investment advisory. You can find it. It's Valeshire.com. You can shoot me an email at info at Valeshire.com if, if that's of interest to you. Cheers, Jeff. Have a great rest of the day. And I hope to catch up again soon. Thanks, Ed. Take care.